Today's sermon passage is found in the first book of the Bible, Genesis, chapter 8, verse 20, through chapter 9, verses 29. If you would turn there with me now as I read, starting in chapter 8, verse 20. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord and took some of every clean animal and some of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And when the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma, the Lord said to his, in his heart, I will never again curse the ground because of man, for the intention of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I ever again strike down every living creature as I have done. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night shall not cease. And God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. The fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth and upon every bird of the heavens, upon everything that creeps on the ground and all the fish of the sea. Into your hand they are delivered. Every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. And as I gave you the green plants, I give you everything. But you shall not eat flesh with its life, that is, its blood. And for your life blood, I will require a reckoning. From every beast, I will require it. And from man, from his fellow man, I will require a reckoning for the life of man. Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. For God made man in his own image. And you, be fruitful and multiply. Increase greatly on the earth and multiply in it. Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, Behold, I establish my covenant with you and your offspring after you, and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the livestock, and every beast of the earth with you, as many as came out of the ark. It is for every beast on the earth. I establish my covenant with you that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood, and never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, this is a sign of the covenant that I made between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. I have set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. When I bring clouds over the earth and the bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant that is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And the waters shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. When the bow is in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. God said to Noah, this is a sign of the covenant that I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. The sons of Noah who went forth from the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Ham was the father of Canaan. These three were the sons of Noah, and from these the people of the whole earth were dispersed. Noah began to be a man of the soil, and he planted a vineyard. He drank the wine of the vineyard and became drunk, and lay uncovered in his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers outside. Then Shem and Japheth took a garment, laid it on both of their shoulders, and walked backward and covered the nakedness of their father. Their faces were turned backward, and they did not see their father's nakedness. When Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his youngest son had done to him, he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of his servants, shall he be to his brothers. He also said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. May God enlarge Japheth and let him dwell in the tents of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. After the flood, Noah lived 350 years. All the days of Noah were 950 years, and he died. Well, thank you, Kat. This morning, as we continue... Uh, on in our study through the book of Genesis, we come to the end of the flood narrative. And as we do, I was reminded uh, of a true story 
uh, that a lot of you are probably familiar with, but I think that it communicates a lot, a lot of what we're seeing in our passage today. The story is of Jim Elliott and his wife, Elizabeth Elliott, who were missionaries that sought to take the gospel to those in the Amazon Valley. And the Elliots were specifically burdened with taking the gospel to those who had never heard the name of Jesus. And so they began to pray for the Lord to lead them to a specific people group. And then they were led to this remote tribe where they sought to, with a group of other missionaries, to make friendly relations with the people who were known to be violent. And they did that by flying a plane really low over this tribe, and they began to drop gifts to these people. And after a number of weeks of of doing this, they were ready to meet these people face to face. And so the husbands of these missionary couples, they, they flew in to meet the people of this tribe. And after some initial friendly relations, they lost radio contact with their wives, who came to find out that roughly five days later, all of these men had been speared to death. And in response... Here's what Elizabeth Elliot did. She went back to the tribe who had killed her husband with her daughter to continue the effort of taking the gospel to a people who still had yet to hear of the gospel. And that story, it blows my mind. But the reality is that the the passage that we have before us today I think that, I, that this passage demonstrates a God who is gracious and merciful in a way that when we look at what Elizabeth Elliot did, it's just a small picture. It's a small picture of the overwhelming grace and mercy that comes from God. And so I hope that as we work our way through this text, that you will see a God who is worth loving supremely over everything that this world has to offer because this is a covenantal God who is faithful to his promises, who demonstrates an abundance of mercy to a human race that all deserve to be washed away in a flood. And so let's remember where we are within the flow of Genesis as we consider what we have to learn from our passage today. Noah is he's getting off of the ark, but again, this, this isn't a cute nursery tale. In these last few chapters, we've seen God pour out his judgment in the form of a flood due to the the wickedness of man's heart. If we look back at chapter six, God says that the earth was corrupt. We then have the really graphic words in verse 13, where God says, I have determined to make an end of all flesh. And then later in that verse, he states, he will destroy them, which is picked up again in verse 17. For behold, I will bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh. And as Noah is stepping off the ark, All this has happened, where God, in his divine judgment, decreates the earth and then recreates it for Noah and his family to step back out onto. But in the midst of that, God gives a little picture of what's to come. And we see that in verse 18 of chapter 6, when God says, but I will establish my covenant with you. Well, we've reached the passage where that happens. And as we, we look at our text, we're going to see five revelations about God that ought to stir our hearts to love him supremely. As Moses, the author of Genesis, is is detailing the end of the flood narrative, he's going to expose various truths and realities about who God is, what he's done, what he's like, and what he's going to do. And as we consider, especially a book such as Genesis, where we we come to narratives that are stories, and what John said last week about cream-filled goodness being inside of these texts, that as we bite down into it, there's cream-filled goodness like a cream-filled donut. That's true in, in this passage. In many ways, that could almost be an introduction to, to all these sermons. I think we saw that last week, but, but I think it's present in other passages, like the genealogies, which, which have much more significance than what would first meet the eye. And I think that that's true in many ways of our passage today. But what's also true in, in narratives, and especially in a book like Genesis, is that there's details that we often get bogged down with, that can distract us from what the main thrust of the passage is saying. I think, I think we saw that most clearly in Genesis 6, 
where there's a temptation to get bogged down with, with who are the sons of God and, and who are the Nephilim. And we miss the point that, that wicked actions flow from a wicked heart. And as we look at our passage today, we're going to see both of these things. We're going to see some more cream filling, and we're going to come across things that are important and have a place, but that can distract us from the bigger picture of what's being communicated. And so as I, I began to read through and study through this passage, there's a lot that we could spend our time talking about. And maybe you came with questions that you were hoping would get answered about burnt offerings and eating meat with blood and what this passage has to say about the death penalty and what in the world went on inside of the tent amongst a whole host of other questions and details that are in our passage that we could spend our time talking about. But as we move through this text, yes, let's marvel at the trees, but not at the expense of the forest. And so as I began to read and to, to pray and to think through this text, I feel that if we all left this morning with just answers to those questions, and I'm not saying that these aren't important questions, but if we walked away and in conversations at, at lunch and throughout the week at, at D.C., just talking about what, what happened in the tent, then I would have failed you in walking us through this passage this morning. And we're going we're gonna to talk about some of those things. But as you leave here this morning... What I want you to walk away with, what I want dominating your mind, your conversations at lunch with those in your DC, is how good and awesome and great and worthy of worship our God is. I pray that you would see and savor the gospel that is to be seen in this text, that your hearts would, would walk away from here with a deep sense of thanksgiving and gratitude as we marvel together at the God who provided an ark for Noah that pictures a present ark in Jesus. This is our God. He is worthy to be loved supremely. And I believe that we'll see that in these five revelations about God. The first revelation about God that we see in our passage today is that God is pleased with worship. We read in verses 20 through 22. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord and took some of every clean animal and some of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And when the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma, the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground because of man, for the intention of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I ever again strike down every living creature as I have done. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night shall not cease. And so Noah has just gotten off of the ark. And he gets off, and, and, and what's the first thing that he does? He doesn't get busy building his house or establishing rule or, or boasting in the reality that it's only him and his family that, that survived. No. What we read is, then Noah built an altar. Why? Because Noah is overwhelmed at the mercy of God that God hadn't wiped out everyone. So his first act immediately is an act of worship. The book of Leviticus tells us that, that a burnt offering is an offering given for the atonement of sin and as an act of thanksgiving and worship to God. It was an offering that was burned completely, and in being completely consumed, it indicated a sense of complete devotion. So this is the first time in all of Scripture that we see a sacrifice. And if you notice, in verse 20, it says that Noah took some of all the clean animals. So remember, back, back in chapter 7, we know that Noah took seven pairs of all the clean animals. And, and just in that, we're given a, a picture of what an acceptable sacrifice is. A clean blood offering. And that's going to be important to remember all throughout the Old Testament as we see pictures of sacrifices that point to a greater once and for all sacrifice. And so just note that as Noah builds this altar. But notice here that he takes some of all of these clean animals and sacrifices them, thus demonstrating this, this overwhelming sense of gratefulness to the Lord for sparing his life and his family. And then in response, the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma, which is to say that the Lord was pleased and is expressing favor toward both the sacrifice and Noah. He's pleased with worship. Ultimately, though, this is a burnt offering. And if you're anything like me, the smell of anything burnt is not pleasing. It's not a smell that you walk into a house and say, wow, that smells really good. But God says this is pleasing. 
Why? Because it's not about the actual smell of the offering that God is concerned with, but rather is with Noah and his heart of worship and thanksgiving and a recognition of needing God's mercy. And so in response, we as the readers and the Israelites as the original audience are being given a clue, a look back into the heart of God. Where in Genesis 6, 7, God said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens, for I am sorry that I have made them. Here, he demonstrates his mercy. And and that's a theme that we've already seen played out in the first few chapters of Genesis. And one that we will continue to see, that despite human wickedness, the Lord's favor and kindness supersedes. In Genesis 3, we're given the promise of Genesis 3.15 that one will come to crush the head of the serpent. In Cain, killing Abel, God provided Seth to preserve the line. And God continues to demonstrate mercy through Noah and the ark. And, And right after the flood, he says in his heart, verse 21, and so in the midst of a world that is still cursed, God is saying he will not add to the already cursed ground. He is the sovereign God who must punish sin. And he he has demonstrated his justness and holiness in response to the sinfulness of man. But we also see that this is a God who is merciful and kind. Both of these things are true about God. And the right response to this God is worship. He delights in and is pleased when we worship. John 4.23 says, But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such people to worship him. Noah, in these few verses, has exemplified worship that is immediate and of the first fruits. And the Lord was pleased. And so in response, we have to be a people who ask ourselves, is this true of us? Are we a people who are quick to worship that we might please the Lord? Are we a people who recognize that all we have is his? Is that demonstrated in the use of our time, talents, and treasures? Or do we give with what's left over? Do we schedule our calendars and see what what days are left over for the gathering and serving others? Or do we pen these things in first? Are we riding in the ark of Jesus but characterized by grumbling and complaining? Or do we see and savor the God who has made a way of salvation Noah comes off the ark and has seen God clearly demonstrate his love and care for Noah and his family. And in the same way, we have seen God who demonstrated his love and care for us clearly at the cross. And so in response, we are to worship. God is pleased in and delights in our worship because he deserves praise and he deserves our worship. He is the God who decreates and recreates. And where we saw that take place Last week, we will continue to see his recreation as we move into chapter 9. And so as we move into this next chapter, we're going to see our second revelation. And that is that God is Lord. And when I say that God is Lord, I mean to highlight God's lordship, which is to highlight his sovereignty, control, and authority. And so while we don't see Lord in these first few verses of chapter 9, I believe that we can clearly see that God is the one who is in charge, the one who is sovereign, the one who dictates terms, the one is, who is creator, who gives mandates. And that first mandate that we see is one that should be really familiar. Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. We see it here in verse 1 and in verse 7. And so as God demonstrates his lordship, specifically in these first seven verses, it's bookended in this mandate to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. And if you remember, we we saw this for the first time way back in chapter 1, verse 28. And so in this recreation, we have a clue here that God is reestablishing the command that was originally given to Adam. And so in a few different ways, Noah is like a new Adam in a new creation. And so Noah has stepped off of this boat into a world that will never again be the same. And yet, God is still God. And because of that, he's given a charge to Noah and his sons, just like he did in chapter 1 to be a representation of God here on earth in order to reflect God's kingly rule over his creation on his behalf. And why does God do this? Because he's still after his glory. 
God's heart is still that the earth would be covered with little image bearers that would point back to him for his glory. And there's, there's so much that could be said about this, but for the sake of time, I want to make this really simple. This isn't about you. This book isn't about you. And this isn't God just saying, hey, how about you just have some kids and, and we start this whole thing over again? Like, no, this is God doing what he's done for all of eternity and what he has and will continue to do for all of eternity. He's after his glory. Isaiah 48, 11, for my own sake, for my own sake, I do it. For how should my name be profaned? My glory I will not give to another. God is saying to Noah and his sons, lest you forget, this is still about me. But if you notice, we read that God blesses them. And I want to note that, that this is important. One theologian on this says, when God gives the mandate to fill the earth, he does it in the context of a blessing. I suggest that the people, for people to image God on a global scale, for you to battle sin, for me to live as if God is the king of my heart, remember, it's those who are living after the fall that get this as their Bible. When they read God wants them to show that he is great and to display him, humanity is lifting up their hands. You and I are lifting up our hands and saying, as much as I'd like to do that, I keep failing. The desires of the world are too great. The pleasures of the world are too compelling. My proneness to anger is too intense. I keep succumbing to that which is evil. My eyes keep looking at that which is wrong. But God graciously from the beginning, didn't just give a commandment to take his image to the end of the earth. He couched it in a blessing, and blessings all throughout Scripture are dependent on God to fulfill. We need blessing because of sin. I'll read that last part again. God graciously, from the beginning, didn't just give a commandment to take his image to the end of the earth. He couched it in a blessing, and blessings all throughout Scripture are dependent on God to fulfill. We need blessing because of sin. We've already seen in the flood the failure of humanity. But we also get a picture in the ark that God will see to it that this commission is done. He's demonstrating his sovereignty in his recreation. Well, let's look at verses two through six. The fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth and upon every bird of the heavens, upon everything that creeps on the ground and all the fish of the sea, into your hand they are delivered. Every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. And as I gave you the green plants, I give you everything. But you shall not eat flesh with its life, that is, its blood. And for your lifeblood, I will require a reckoning. From every beast I will require, and from man. From his fellow man, I will require a reckoning for the life of man. Whoever sheds the blood of man by man shall his blood be shed, for God made man in his own image. If you notice, this sounds a whole lot like the beginning of Genesis, where we have dominion over animals, provision for food, prohibition, man made in God's image. And so while it's not the exact same, you, you can pick up on the continuation of this recreation that's taking place. And we see that the God that created is the God that recreated, which has radical implications for our lives. If God is the creator, then he dictates the terms. He declares what's right and wrong. It's not about what the preacher says. It's not about what one person prefers over another. It's about God who has created everything, including you and me. And so he decides what's good and bad. He decides what's right and what's wrong. And here we have the provision to eat animals as long as you don't eat the blood. Leviticus goes on to make clear that the, the blood of an animal belongs to God that there is life in the blood. We see all throughout the Old Testament that blood is important and has a special significance where it served to point to Jesus. But this is not just the blood of animals, but, but also the blood of mankind. And what's being communicated here is that life is valuable. Blood is significant in the animals, and it's certainly significant and valuable in humans. Why? Because this is God's creation. And for us, we are made in God's image. Black, white, straight, gay, male, female, young, old, all in the image of God. Yes, even those in blatant sin are made in his image. And so as we read through these verses and the, and the recreation that's taking place, we're confronted with a creator God that is Lord. 
a God that we are meant to serve and glorify and honor and obey. Then our third revelation about God that ought to stir our hearts to love him supremely is that God is a covenantal God. We see this in verses 8 through 11 of our text. Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, Behold, I establish my covenant with you and your offspring after you. And with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the livestock, and every beast of the earth with you. As many as came out of the ark, it is for every beast of the earth. I establish my covenant with you that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood. And never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. And so what we have taking place here is God placing an obligation on himself, making a promise that is going to dictate the terms and define his relationship with Noah and also to the entire human race. That's what covenant means. And that's what's happening here. And this is significant. We we didn't really look a whole lot at this, but back in chapter 8, verse 21, God makes a reference to the heart of man. He says, it's evil. We don't read God wiped everyone out and and only righteousness remains. And so everything's hunky-dory. Because mankind's now in real good shape. No, we read that mankind is, is still evil. And because of that, it would be completely in bounds for God to send flood after flood after flood after flood and to wipe out mankind over and over and over and over again. But instead, he makes a covenant to say, I will not do that. Like, uh, do you sense the immense amount of mercy that God is exercising and even making this covenant? This is not what we deserve. We deserve to be wiped out. Often people will object to the God of the Bible and, and we'll talk about the difficulty in submitting to a God of so much wrath. And they'll especially highlight Old Testament stories. But if we're really honest, no one wants to serve a God who doesn't punish sin. We live in a time where even in a distorted way, people are screaming for justice. And God, as a just God, has every right to destroy us. But he makes a covenant, again, to say, I will not do that. Even when verse 4 through 6 indicate God knows sins such as murder will exist. And that reality ought to leave us in awe and wonder at why he would make such a covenant. As we consider covenants, it's important to make a note that we're going to keep seeing covenants all throughout the storyline of Scripture. Like the Bible isn't a bunch of rules and stories. Rather, it's a story about redemption and God's kingdom that advances and unfolds through his covenants. And in that, God is faithful to his covenants. In his covenant with Noah, God is recognizing that the only way the promise of Genesis 3.15 comes to pass is if he withholds his judgment. And so this covenant specifically has massive implications for the unfolding of Genesis 3.15. He chooses to graciously withhold his wrath. The book of Isaiah gives us even more insight into God's heart and his faithfulness to this covenant. We read in Isaiah 54, 9 through 10, this is like the days of Noah to me. As I swore that the waters of Noah should no more go over the earth, so I have sworn that I will not be angry with you and will not rebuke you. For the mountains may depart and the hills be removed, but my steadfast love shall not depart from you and my covenant of peace shall not be removed, says the Lord who has compassion on you. And so despite the sinfulness of man, God will keep his covenant. And this isn't just a covenant to Noah. We're given no indication that this is ever annulled. Additionally, what we have in these verses is is, is often referred to as as common grace, where God is demonstrating his grace to the the whole world, whether or not they believe in him. And we see that, that his covenant will remain because he is gracious and merciful. In fact, the scriptures say it is God's wrath that is his strange work. And his covenant reminds us of that reality. He is a covenantal God who we ought to love supremely. But is that true of you? 
Do you love him supremely? Is this God enough? Because we can come here and just take this as a cool story or we can hold on to this love in the midst of deep pain. That this is a covenantal God who is enough when we lose a family member, when we're lonely, when we're single and desire to be married, when we lose a spouse or a child, when we feel the, the brokenness of our bodies. This is an incredible comfort to see that this is our God. We need not doubt his goodness. It's also a reminder that in the midst of temptation, when we seek to satisfy the wicked desires of our hearts, when we look to our marriages, our kids, our jobs, our entertainment, to be and do for us what only God was meant to be and do for us, this is to serve as a reminder. Let it serve as a reminder. Like, may, may your hearts be stirred to see that he is enough, that he is to be supremely loved. May you marvel at this covenantal God. I'm, I'm pleading with you as a, as a church to behold this great and awesome and covenantal God. And as we keep reading in our text, we, we, we come to the very reminder of this specific covenant. In doing so, we see our fourth revelation demonstrate most clearly that God is gracious and merciful. We read in verse 12, And God said, This is the sign of the covenant that I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. I have set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. When I bring clouds over the earth and the bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant that is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And the water shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. When the bow is in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant that I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. So we look at these verses. I want to show you something that I, I, I think is pretty cool. And that is that, that verses 12 through 17 are chiastic. And what that means is that, is that if you look at verse 12, it mirrors verse 17. And God said, this is the sign. And then verses 13 and 14, they, they mirror verse 16. He sets the bow in the clouds. And then right there in the middle, verse 15 what's perhaps most important, I will remember. He will remember his promise. Again, we, we talked about this last week, but this isn't God setting some sort of alarm as if he's going to forget. That's not what he's saying. Rather, God is committing that he is going to keep his covenant. It's an ongoing attestment to the reality that he is faithful to keep his covenant. And what's remarkable about this is that God is faithful despite the reality that you and I wander every day. A few years ago, our church walked through the book of Hosea and how God calls Hosea to be faithful to his adulterous wife, Gomer. And yet Gomer continues to practice adultery. And so we have this picture of, of marriage and a spouse that, that continues to cheat, and yet Hosea is faithful. And we see adultery all over in our world today, within our culture. But you know where else adultery exists? In you and in me. We are a people who, even as blood-bought sinners, cheat and commit spiritual adultery with the God of the universe. But... He has made a covenant and he has set his bow in the clouds as a sign. What's interesting to note about the rainbow is that rainbows don't just show up on days when it's 70 and sunny. Rainbows show up when there's a storm, when it rains. And just in that, 
we, we, have, we have a tiny glimpse of the gospel, that God's grace and mercy persist in the midst of sin. Another thing to note, though, is, is that the word for bow is literally a weapon of war. And so God is saying, I'm, I'm laying up my war bow. Charles Spurgeon, Baptist preacher, says of the rainbow, just look at it. If it was pointed down, wouldn't that make you nervous? At a moment's notice, it could just snap. But it's laid up, it's pointed up, it's aimed up. It goes on. God has not stopped being a God of judgment and wrath. He's aiming his arrows of wrath at someone else. They're going into someone else. And so when we see the rainbow, we ourselves ought to be reminded that, that we have a Savior who took the arrows that are due us because we have a God who is gracious and merciful. And, and praise God that he sent that Savior. It's no accident that the remaining verses exist in our text today because we see immediately that, that Noah is not the one that's going to bring about salvation. Noah, just like Adam, failed. So you'll notice our fifth and final revelation, it'll be on your handout, about God that ought to stir our hearts to love him supremely is that God has sent a better Noah. And so to set the stage here, we have God sending a flood of judgment on the earth, and yet he saves Noah and his family. And Noah responds in, in worship by building an altar, and God is pleased. And he establishes a covenant with Noah, the same Noah that was said to be righteous and blameless and, and walked with God. And God has demonstrated his love and care and goodness. And then what happens next? Starting in verse 18, which set this, the stage. The sons of Noah who went forth from the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Ham was the father of Canaan. These three were the sons of Noah, and from these the people of the whole earth were dispersed. And then verse 20. Noah began to be a man of the soil, and he planted a vineyard. He drank of the wine and became drunk and lay uncovered in his tent. And as you read through this passage... You come to these verses, I think it's natural to, to respond with, you've got to be kidding me. Like, like, how could Noah do this? What was he thinking? And it's similar to the fall in Genesis 3 against the backdrop of, of Genesis 2, where you say of Adam, you had everything. But as we see this play out again, I think that there's, there's two really practical points of application. The first being, what we see here, I think, really clearly is that God sent a flood and there's a recreation and a second chance and an opportunity to start fresh, but the problem of the heart remains. That's what's ultimately needed in our lives is for someone to come to change our hearts. I was talking to a friend last week and he, he's not walking with the Lord. He hasn't placed his, his hope and his trust completely in Jesus for his salvation and he's had a hard year and he, he was telling me that he is trying to get back up on his feet and, and piece his life together and so he's recently started going back to church and I told him like, like, like yes if you are not going to a gospel preaching church go but that's not what you need you need your heart to be changed and so if you are here this morning and you think just being around church and doing some religious deeds and the good vibes that you get from being here, and that's all you need, I am telling you, you will stand at the judgment feet of God and he will say, depart from me, I never knew you. And so you need to really ask yourself if you have ever placed your trust in Jesus alone for your salvation and if you have repented of your sins. If you've done that, the Bible says you will be saved. And so as we keep reading through Genesis in, in the coming weeks and, and months, we're going to be reminded over and over and over again that we need someone to come and change our hearts, which are dead, and in no way capable of following after him if he doesn't first act. So that's the first thing to note here. The second is that you can never stop fighting your sin. 
Look at Adam. Look at Noah. If anyone was set up for success, to live a life of complete and total devotion to God, it was them. But Adam and Noah failed. We have to continually be at war against our sin. And God has sent his spirit as the great helper. But we have to fight. We are in a war. I think for many of us, we can resonate with with this camp-like spiritual high. And it happened all throughout high school for me, where we'd go to these these camps. And and, and students and high schoolers would would hear good preaching and and great music. And and kids would be throwing their hands up in the air, saying, I surrender my life to him, and my life is the Lord's. And then literally, the next week, these same people that were just doing that, that just heard all that, that preaching, they're dishonoring their parents. Succumbing to gossip and slander, committing rampant sexual sin, and living like that whole week didn't happen. And this isn't just a high school problem. How, how many of you have gone from a Sunday morning or returned from D.C. and failed to serve your spouse, have acted in anger towards your kids, have run to images on a screen? The world is full of distractions, especially in our country. I was talking to, to someone just last week who returned from overseas and said, I, I forgot how many things in this country are competing for my attention. We must fight our sin continually. And you can talk about this more in, in your D.C. this week. But real quick, just, 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 a, few, just a few words on, on ways in which we can fight our sin. We need to be a people who get in the word who fervently pray, and we need others in the body to come alongside us, to to hold us accountable, and to walk with us. One of the things I I do here is I oversee our discipleship communities, our small groups. And so I'd argue that the best way to do that is, is not just to attend a DC, but to commit to a DC as a as a people who can intimately walk with you and vice versa. And so if, if you want to get plugged into a DC and you aren't plugged into a DC, please come talk to me after the gathering. But those are just two really practical points of application. And if I were to say a third, I would just say, be really, 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 really careful with alcohol. That's all the time I have to say on that. We, we've got to keep moving in our passage. We'll pick up in verse 22 and through the end of the chapter. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers outside. Then Shem and Japheth took a garment, laid it on both their shoulders, and walked backward and covered the nakedness of their father. Their faces were turned backward, and they did not see their father's nakedness. When Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his youngest son had done to him, he said, "'Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants shall he be to his brothers.'" He also said, blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. May God enlarge Japheth and let him dwell in the tents of Shem and let Canaan be his servant. After the flood, Noah lived 350 years. All the days of Noah were 950 years and he died. And and so I've, I've already made brief mention of this kind of second fall. And so what we have is Noah as this new Adam who just like Adam, has a similar call of imaging God all over the world. And then just like Adam, he falls in in the garden or in the vineyard. As Adam is filled with shame, so too Noah is filled with shame. And then there's cursing and blessing. And so we'll talk a little bit about what's going on here, but, but don't miss that Noah fails just like Adam. And the cry of the Israelites' hearts as the original audience is that we need someone better. And the cry of our hearts is to praise God that he's sent someone better because sin still remains. And we see that right here in the tent where Ham saw the nakedness of his father and then tells his two brothers. So there's a lot of theories and ideas and questions about what's happening here. But I think that if we just look at the remedy for this situation, that we can begin to piece together and and gather what exactly went wrong. And we see the remedy being Shem and Japheth taking a garment, walking backwards, 
and covering their father's nakedness. And so where Ham looked and proclaimed his father's shame, Shem and Japheth looked away and covered. Where Ham celebrated and mocked his father, Shem and Japheth sought to cover. Where Ham dishonored his father, Shem and Japheth honored their father despite his sin. And we may not feel like, like this is very serious, if this is all that's taken place, but I believe that this is a violation of the commandment to honor your father and mother, which should be a big deal now, but is certainly a big deal within this culture and context. And so at the moment, right now, I'm unconvinced that anything much more is taking place in these verses. But where we can all agree is I think where we need to be focused. And that is that Noah's drunkenness and the sin of his offspring isn't right. It's wrong. And that's made really clear when Noah awakens from his drunkenness. And what he says is actually the only time in the Bible that Noah's words are recorded. And he curses and blesses. And what's surprising is that in verse 25, he curses Canaan, not Ham. But if we look back, we can see that our passage is is beginning to set us up for this reality. When we are introduced to Ham as the father of Canaan. But this still begs the question, why Canaan? And and to that, I believe that we have to remember the original audience, and the original audience is Israel. And so here, Noah is cursing the Canaanites, which in and of itself is, is a powerless curse unless it is God's will, but it was God's will. And thus, Noah's words are anticipating judgment that is to come on the Canaanites, who the Israelites were instructed to drive out due to their immense wickedness. And then following the cursing is blessing, which is a theme that we've seen and will continue to see. But just as we were initially surprised with the recipient of the curse, we might be initially surprised with the recipient of the blessing, which is the Lord. The Lord who is worthy of all praise and blessing. But in blessing the Lord, Noah is blessing Shem in the highest way. And so where Canaan is cursed, Shem is blessed. But then what is happening with with Japheth? Now I'd argue what's happening here in, in verse 27 is that we have a verse that anticipates the ingrafting of the Gentiles into the people of God. And so then, in the cursing and the blessing, there's, there's still this idea that, that there's two lines. And as Noah passes, these lines persist. The line of the woman and the line of the serpent. And as we've already seen, we're all born into the line of the serpent. But through Jesus, we can change our genealogical record. That despite the immense wickedness and sinfulness, hope and blessing remain. We all come here today as sinners, but the God revealed to us in this text is a God who's made a way of salvation by preserving the line through withholding of his wrath and then pouring out his wrath on his son Jesus, who in doing so bore our sins as our substitute for all those who place their trust in him. If you'll notice the points on your worship guide, you'll you'll see it in the, the first four. God is, God is, God is, God is, and then God has. Because as we consider these last few verses, we can clearly see that we need one who is better. But the good news of the gospel is that God has has sent a better Noah. Jesus is the better Noah, the one who never sinned and never failed where Adam and Noah did. Jesus is the fulfillment of the sacrificial system that is established here in our passage. He's the one who came and lived completely in a subjection to God's word. He glorified the Father in everything he did. He came as the promised one depicted in Genesis 3.15. He crushed the head of the serpent. He was sent by a covenantal God to usher in the new covenant where he promised the forgiveness of sins. He went to the cross and he took the wrath of God that was due us that we might experience the grace and mercy of the Father. He was the better Adam, the better Noah. And as we keep reading our Bibles, he was the better Abraham, the better Moses, the better David. And he has come and he's made a way of salvation. He has come to usher us back into the new and better Eden where there will be no more pain, no more sorrow, no more tears, no more sin. This is the God that we serve. This is the God that we come to worship When we come to a passage like this, we see a covenantal God who is worthy to be treasured and loved supremely in our lives. 
there's a song, Grace and Peace, that we sing at times on Sunday mornings. And I, I love the lyrics. And I've found myself listening to this song all throughout this week. I think that they do well to depict what's revealed to us in this passage about God. That he is a covenantal God. That he has been so immensely gracious despite the judgment that we all deserve. The lyrics read as follows. Oh, how can this be? For lawbreakers and thieves, for the worthless the least, you have said that our judgment is death for all eternity, without hope, without rest. Oh, what an amazing mystery. What an amazing mystery that your grace has come to me. Grace and peace, oh, how can this be? The matchless king of all paid the blood price for me. Slaughtered lamb, what atonement you bring. The vilest sinner's heart can be cleansed, can be free. Oh, what an amazing mystery. What an amazing mystery that your grace has come to me. Grace and peace, oh, how can this be? Let songs of gratefulness ever rise, never cease. Loved by God and called as a saint, my heart is satisfied in the riches of Christ. Oh, what an amazing mystery. What an amazing mystery that your grace has come to me. Oh, what an amazing love I see. What an amazing love I see that your grace has come to me. Oh, what an amazing love. I see. This is the God that is worthy to be supremely treasured and valued and loved. Oh, how can this be that we have a God who bestows grace upon grace upon grace upon grace to sinners like you and me who deserve None of it. And so let us go from here today as a church, having our hearts stirred by the God revealed to us in this text. And let us, by the power of his spirit, seek to be a people who, above all else, love him supremely. He is worthy of this love. Let's pray. God, you are so good. You have demonstrated an abundance of, of grace and mercy. And yet we as your people are a forgetful people who don't live in a manner that reflects your supreme worth and value. But God, I pray that you would, by your spirit, help us to be a people who love you supremely a people who quickly forsake worthless idols and a people who rightly image you. As we move from here this morning, we, we recognize that we are stepping out into a world that, that hates you, a world that is seeking to distract and, and command our attention. But I ask that, that we would be a people with our gaze fixed on you, a people who live in complete devotion to you as the God who is worthy of all our affections. Lord, would you stir our hearts and our affections to be supremely for you. I pray this in the name of Jesus, who came as the better Noah. It's in his name I pray. Amen.